About four years ago, I used to brew beer quite a lot. There would always be something fermenting in my house, and the basement where I kept the fermenters would always have a delicious smell whenever you walked in. However, after about two years, I realized I actually had quite a low alcohol tolerance and didn't enjoy drinking as much stuff as I was making, so I stopped. In one of the last batches I made, I wanted to try something new. I heard that whiskey was made by distilling fermented barley wort, and so, even though I had already added the hops which gives beer its bitter flavor, I wanted to see what would happen if I distilled the wort that I had. I might produce some really awful smelling stuff in the distillate, but maybe by measuring how much I collect, I could see how much alcohol my beer had. The reason I thought this would work was because the alcohol produced in beer and other fermented drinks is called ethanol. The rest of the drink is almost completely water. Because the boiling points of water and ethanol are different from each other, it should be possible to separate them using a temperature gradient in a distillation apparatus. This is reflected in vapor-liquid equilibrium charts for water and ethanol, which are constructed by either thermodynamic correlations or by measuring the concentrations of the substances in question. For water and ethanol, the data from the measurements are available. According to the 9th edition of Perry's Chemical Engineer's Handbook, such a chart can be found within an enthalpy concentration chart. This chart contains the data at standard atmospheric pressure for differences in enthalpy between different material phases of mixtures of water and ethanol at different temperatures. That's kind of a mouthful, but the important part is over here. Starting at the bubble or boiling line, we are instructed by the caption to draw a vertical line until it hits the auxiliary line, which is constructed from vapor-liquid equilibrium data. Drawing a horizontal from the intersection will hit the dual line. The dew line is so named because it represents the composition of the liquid that results from condensing the vapor from the auxiliary line, and since that's what distillation does, this is what we want to do. So, according to theory, if I heat up a 5 weight percent mixture of water and ethanol, which is common in beer, to the minimum temperature where it starts to boil, I'll have a 45 weight percent mixture of water and ethanol in the distillate. Unfortunately, I hadn't heard of this idea back in 2017. All I knew was that the boiling points were different, so I expected to be able to distill off the azeotropic ethanol right from the start. So I just heated the bottoms flask until I saw a rolling boil. Here are some of the pictures I took in December 29th of 2017 when I did this. Here you can see me lugging up the fermenter to my desk, and I filled a flask full of what beer wort was left. It got all the yeast that sank to the bottom, but after a day of waiting for it to settle, I got a beautiful amber layer sitting on top. Holding flasks full of beautiful liquids up to light like this makes me feel like some kind of alchemist, and it felt pretty cool despite how simple this preparation was. I kept the clear top layer and set up a single stage distillation. Here you can see I use a Liebig condenser fed by cold water. The cold water is pumped via siphon through the condenser counter currents to the distillate so that the distillate gets colder as it moves to the collecting flask. A two-way distilling adapter is used so that I'm not heating a closed system and, accordingly, the secondary exit from the adapter leads to a water trap. I put a water trap in here because I was doing this in my room and I was afraid that ethanol vapors might escape the apparatus and go into where I slept every night. Now, of course, I moved out of my room. You should not do chemical experiments in your bedroom. It's just a bad idea. Anyways, on the bottom side, I placed a boiling flask in a hot bath full of Mazzola brand corn oil heated by a hot plate. According to the book Corn, Chemistry and Technology, published by the American Association of Cereal Chemists, the main constituents of corn oil are linoleic, oleic, and palmitic acids. From the data at the Environmental Protection Agency's CompTOX database, these materials have an atmospheric boiling point of 264, 282, and 283 degrees Celsius, respectively, which means that I could get the beer to at least 100 degrees without the oil vaporizing all into my bedroom. Indeed, here in the middle of the distillation, you can see that I achieved a rolling boil in the boiling flask. At the time, I was just having fun watching the liquid boil away, but watching this now, I believe I was boiling out a lot more of the water than was predicted by the chart, probably everything in this region. This means that not only was I mistaken about being able to get azeotropic ethanol right from the bat from a single stage distillation, but also that I wasn't boiling the flask as gently as I probably should have been. 
According to the data, in order to get azeotropic ethanol, I would have needed to do at least a five-stage distillation, or equivalently, I would have needed to repeat a single-stage distillation like this five times. Anyways, past me, blissfully oblivious, kept the distillation going until I filled the receiving flask full, and then after it cooled, I sealed the flask with a glass stopper and I sealed the bottoms flask with plastic wrap. I had heard that whiskey takes on its color through the process of aging, so I wanted to see what would happen if I just left it sitting there and just for fun I kept the bottom flask too. My original plan was to leave it alone for a year, but I just kept ignoring it. So there it sat on my desk for over three years. But now I have other projects I need these flasks for, so it's time to finally see what's been going on inside of them. Okay, so I got the flasks here in front of me now, and when I found them, they were actually covered in a thick layer of dust. Also, as you can see, the uh, distillate here is basically completely unchanged since when I first did the experiment. It's still completely transparent and colorless. So um, that didn't work out. I, I actually heard recently that the reason why whiskey turns brown is because while it comes out of the, uh, of the distilling machine like this, uh, basically like water, but then you store it in wood barrels and over time that actually makes it turn brown. And clearly I didn't do that, so, oh well. Well, here is also the, the bottoms flask. There's some buildup from, I don't know if that's dead yeast or just some other scum. Um, but yeah, this also looks the same as the day that I finished the experiment. Nice amber color. You can also see um, it's pretty much clear as well. So yeah, nothing changed. Alright, so now I'm going to take a sniff test. Now, I'm not going to drink this because I've heard that when you're boiling homemade moonshine, uh, you could be distilling over some methanol as well, and that is really bad for you, um, but smelling should be fine. So we'll start with the distillate, and that's this clear flask over here. This hasn't been opened for three years. That's just hitting me right now, so. Wow, so it's coming over. All right, I'm just gonna take a sniff here. It actually smells alcoholy. That wasn't expected. Yeah, like sweet. This smells like um, when you open a bottle of sake or something. That was not expected. I didn't think it would actually smell good. Huh. Well, there's that. Now, uh, let's smell the bottoms. This might be a whole lot worse. Okay. Oh, okay. Yeah, that smells, um, it smells like just generic organic vapor. Like if you're walking into a lab with preserved, um, preserved plants or animals, um, that's what this smells like. Yeah, like it's not very pleasant at all. Don't know what I was expecting. Um, but yeah, that. This is pretty much how bad I thought both of them would be. This is nice. I'm kind of sad I'm going to have to throw this out now. Having finally completed this experiment, I rinsed out the flasks and I'm going to blow some air in there every day with my bulb pump just to flush out any smell that might have remained. Overall, it feels pretty good to bring this project to a close after three years of ignoring it on my desk, and now I'm ready for a whole lot more new experiments in the future.